We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. An historic gathering, the first ever at the United Nations on Monday, commemorated al-Nakba, which means the catastrophe, and marked the beginning of the apartheid state of Israel and the massacre and displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinian people from their homes. Welcome to this week's episode of The Real Story on the Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today, we're talking to Dr. Nazia Kazi. She is a professor of anthropology at Stockton University, the author of the book, Islamophobia, Race and Global Politics, which was just updated and re-released. Dr. Kazi, welcome back to The Socialist Program. Thank you so much for having me. Well, in the last days, uh, Nakba, the catastrophe, uh, has been marked by demonstrations, rallies, activities all around the world, uh, not just in the Middle East, not just in Palestine, but even in Washington, D.C. I was at a protest right outside the White House, mainly young Palestinians, people whose grandparents would have been the ones driven from their historic ancestral homes. Uh, they were there. And you can see that the resistance of the Palestinian people is, in fact, what basically has allowed the Palestinian people as a people to continue to exist, because most people's continued existence is based in uh, the, uh, the land that they occupy, but they were driven from that land. But the idea of Palestine, the consciousness of Palestine, the resistance of Palestine means that Palestine lives. And while there are demonstrations every year marking uh, al-Nakba, the catastrophe, this time it was at the United Nations. And the Israeli government went on a diplomatic war drive to try to prevent countries uh, from attending. They tried to get countries to boycott. And the United States and Britain and a few other countries did, but most of the world was there. And the head of the Palestinian Authority, who's certainly no radical, called for the Israeli government to be expelled or at least suspended from UN membership because the Israeli state has violated more than 1,000 resolutions that have been passed over the decades, both at the General Assembly and at the United Nations. It seems to me, uh, Professor, that while the U.S. is steadfast in its defense of the Israeli apartheid government, it's becoming ever more isolated. Absolutely. Um, I'm reminded of the, um, you know, soccer games, uh, the World Cup that happened and, uh, you know, just the global show of solidarity with the Palestinian cause. And this has been true for quite some time. The global community is able to see, and increasingly this applies to the U.S. too, um, just how, you know, repressive the, the state of Israel is. I mean, for those of us who have been paying attention to, um, you know, the violence of Israeli settler colonialism, when you know amnesty declares that it has found israel to be pra a practitioner of apartheid we're kind of like well duh you know it's obvious it's like saying the sky is blue but this was a major demonstration of just how legitimate the claims of the you know palestinian resistance movement have become um, this became very clear during the various movement for Black Lives uprisings, both in 2020 and in 2014, when we saw parallels being made between the violence and repression of the Israeli occupation forces, also known as the IDF, um, and the violence of U.S. police forces, which many times received direct training from the Israeli military. Um, we see increasing literature, books, scholarship being published comparing, you know, uh, the repression of indigenous people in the U.S. to the repression of indigenous people in Palestine. Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right to highlight how the global community is able to recognize what for quite some time both the U.S. and Israel have tried to shroud. 
Now, when it comes to the United Nations, this is a really interesting question um, because absolutely, we see you know what happened on Nakba Day at the UN as just another one of these instances where there is it, it's becoming increasingly impossible to deny um, the the violence of Israeli settler colonialism. But of course, for those of us who know our history, and I'm sure we'll get into this a bit more soon, um, it was the UN that was sort of complicit in handing over um, Palestine, you know, to the British mandate and ultimately to Zionist settlement. So there's a really, um, you know, amb ambivalent history there that perhaps we can talk about. Yeah, indeed. I want to get into that. I think it's really important that we, we the audience, uh, we the people of the United States, we the people of the world, have a full understanding of the history because, you know, the U.S. presents uh, the contest, the combat, the, the struggle, the confrontation in Palestine as a struggle between peoples or a religious struggle rather than framing it as what it really is, as a historic struggle against colonialism and a struggle by colonialism to impose a colonial uh, power on uh, indigenous people. So I want to get I want to get into that. But I do want to just flag this point at the, that you just highlighted about the UN. When the world started to come together uh, and boycott racist South Africa uh, in the early 1980s, and it became sort of a fad almost, a cause celeb, people were getting arrested all over the world, um, it made a difference because the boycott of the South African racist apartheid regime made the continuation of that regime uh, well, it made its days numbered, and eventually the United States recognized that. Also, there was other international factors, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the ability, perhaps, to have a, a negotiated rather than a revolutionary solution to the problem of apartheid led to a negotiated outcome. But this is where things were with South Africa 40 years ago. The world started to move together, and I just want to highlight that what appears to be an ever-present, omnipotent state apparatus like the South African government appeared to be actually can fall. Absolutely. I mean, we see, you know, this sea change, really. I mean, uh, even just recently, um, if we were to think about, um, you know, Kenneth Roth uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School having his appointment rescinded because of statements he's made about Israel. Or a few years ago, you know, the preeminent scholar Angela Davis having an award rescinded uh, from uh, Birmingham, where she's from. Or before that, you know, Professor Stephen Saleda, himself Palestinian, fired from a tenured position for his tweet condemning Operation Protective Edge. We see really like all the classic hallmarks of repression and censorship being pulled out because there are these changes in public sentiment, because it's becoming sort of undeniable to acknowledge, um, you know, the realities of uh, repression um, that are carried out systematically by the state of Israel. I want to play a quick clip from, it's from Al Jazeera. Uh, it was made in, in sort of advance of Al Nakba, the catastrophe uh, but I think it's, it's only about 35 seconds, but I want to play it and then get your reaction. 70 years have passed since the Nakba, the catastrophe in Arabic, took place in Palestine in 1948, in which more than 750,000 Palestinians were forcefully displaced from their homes and pushed into refugee camps in East Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and neighboring countries. But the Nakba didn't end in 1948. The catastrophe continues to affect more than 12 million Palestinians, who remain stateless today. Historical Palestine was mostly made up of Palestinian Muslims, Christians, and a small number of Jews, who generally lived together peacefully. You know, it's so interesting. We have, what is it, 12 million refugees or 12 million descendants of people who were driven from their homes. And is that little clip makes clear the Middle East and Palestine in particular, historic Palestine, it had Muslims and Christians in the majority. This is the birthplace of Jesus. It's a very holy place for Islam and for Judaism. It had a smaller number of indigenous Jewish uh, residents, but those people lived in peace for thousands of years. I mean, literally a couple thousand years or more or less in peace, maybe it wasn't always 
you know, smooth sailing, but there wasn't any major war between them. And then there's endless war, and, and the presentation here is, oh, these people just can't get along, when it's obvious that the people did get along, that that actually isn't the problem. Yeah, um, you know, at the, around the same time that the Nakba occurred, another major um, catastrophe occurred in my own in India, right, with this huge mass migration of people across borders um, as India and Pakistan formed. And the same kind of logic that is applied there, that there are these two groups of people, Hindus and Muslims, who just simply can't get along. It's this age-old conflict is what we see, is what you're referring to with what takes place in conversations about Israel and Palestine, that there's some kind of almost like quintessential, primordial, innate hostility between groups of people who just simply can't get along. Um, and this is one of the tricks of racism. This is one of the tricks of racist colonialism to make hostility and um, ethnic strife or religious strife to make them unconnected to political and material contexts. So for what you're pointing to, the ways in which um, you know, Palestine included a range of religious and ethnic communities who largely got along, um, forces us to think about how it was the, you know, colonial project that not only created these hostilities, but relied on these divisions and these hostilities in order to function. Um, you know, and the, and the same is true anywhere, anywhere we see um, racial capitalism, really. I mean, the same is true of the American racial order, you know, that there, that the divisions we often see were produced, were stoked to serve a, a project, a political project. And in this case, it was the project of the creation of a, of a colonial state uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, and, and let's go back to the World War I period. I mean, World War I is um, a war that people, can, if you ask people, what was World War I about? Most people can't tell you. I mean, Bob Dylan, in, in his song with God on Our Side, he actually has a whole verse on, about it. He says, uh, World War I came and it went. The reason for fighting I never did get. But I learned to accept it and accept it with pride, for you don't count the dead when God's on your side. Meaning everybody was going off to slaughter each other. God was on everybody's side, or so their, their governments told them. But World War I was a war that can be explained. It was a war for colonies between the different, especially European uh, colonial empires. And there were important sort of uh, decisions made, mainly made in secret. Uh, there was the Sykes-Picot Treaty signed by the British and the French in Tsarist Russia. I think that was in 1916. They expected the central powers that included the Ottoman Empire to, to be defeated, and then the Ottoman Empire's Arab lands were going to be divided between the victors, uh, and that would have included Britain, France, and Tsarist Russia. And then the Russian Revolution happened, and the Bolsheviks under Lenin exposed the treaty. That's the reason, the only reason we know about it was that the secret deal was made between British and French colonialism to divide up the Arab world, and Palestine, as well as the rest of the Arab world, what we today call Syria or Iraq or Lebanon, they're all divided up by the colonial powers and it had nothing to do with Jewish people. I mean, the word Jews does not appear in any of those discussions about Sykes-Picot. Let's just, again, go into this a little bit more for the history, the thing that actually people don't have and the thing that prevents people from actually understanding what's going on today. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916 was signed on May 16th. So this week commemorates um, the, the creation of this, as you say, secret agreement and a secret colonial agreement. Okay, Sykes-Picot was a top-down project spearheaded by two very rich people, Mark Sykes and Francois Picot, a British man and a Frenchman. Um, of course, Mark Sykes would later be key in the Balfour Declaration, which I'm sure we can get into soon. But this was a top-down project. As with all colonial projects, there was no Palestinian at the table. Pal the Palestinians were not consulted. Um, Arabs were not consulted. This was a European project. For those who know about, for instance, the, the scramble for Africa, it's a very similar instance of European powers sitting down at a table and deciding what happens with another region, with a region that has been marked as open to colonial domination. 
And of course, through Sykes-Picot, the French and the British decide how to parcel out the Middle East, cutting through ethnic communities, cutting through religious communities. So, you know, there is, especially in the U.S., this popular idea that over there, the Middle East, people just can't get along. There's all this ethnic strife. There's all this, you know, religious hostility and divisions, which ignores, once again, how those divisions were Um, exacerbated or even created through this project of parceling out and dividing up the region we call, you know, the Middle East. So Sykes-Picot, really what it did was it decided which regions would be under, quote unquote, direct French control, which regions would be under direct or formal British control, which would be under, quote unquote, British influence, which would be under French influence, and then for the purposes of our discussion, which would be a so-called international zone. You're right to point to how it was Lenin who exposed this secret agreement after the overthrow of the Russian Tsar. In fact, when he discovered it, he called it appropriately the Treaty of Colonial Thieves. I mean, let's be clear, between World War I and World War II, there's a drastic change in the global economy. Oil becomes perhaps the most important global commodity. And the world powers are quickly figuring out ways to gain control and hold on to control of oil rich regions. I mean, this really becomes sort of an obsession in the West. I mean, that's, we can't understand the British in Iran, for instance, without understanding the legacy of oil. So, you know, um, this is an important precursor to the establishment of the state of Israel. The, the, Endless pogroms and repression and massacre of Jewish people uh, in Europe certainly predated the rise of Nazism uh, and the the Holocaust and the killing of millions of Jews and others, uh, Roma people, gay people, communists, socialists, Ukrainians, Russians in particular, uh, the people in the Baltics. I mean, the, the Holocaust wasn't simply a Jewish imposed on the Jewish population. It was a terrible genocide and a terrible war, a war that took almost 100 million lives in five years, like unbelievable. Nothing like that had ever happened in human history. But this pre, this oppression of Jews in Europe by European feudalists and then European capitalists, it was a hallmark of Europe for many centuries, not simply under the Nazi period. And the British government didn't care about Jews, and the French government didn't care about Jews, and certainly Tsarist Russia didn't care about Jews. None of them cared about Jews. But after the Sykes-Picot Treaty, where there's this secret deal made between Britain, France, and Russia, Tsarist Russia, to divide up the Arab lands amongst themselves. In other words, it was going to become the new colonial power replacing the, the decline or defeated Ottoman Empire. Uh, during that time, when the when the area of what is what is called Palestine was couldn't be decided upon upon by those countries, there was the British wanted it, and the French said no, and the French wanted it, and the British said no. So they said, okay, as you mentioned, it'll be an international zone. And then after the Sykes Picot Treaty, the British government was very very critical of Sykes Picot because they thought British colonialism should have Palestine. And it was then, it was only then that the British colonial imperialist government decided that they needed a cause rather than strictly narrow, self-interested colonialism to justify why Britain should control Palestine. And that's when the Balfour Declaration is signed and sent to the Zionists. And they say, we believe there must be a Jewish homeland and it should be in Palestine and we will be its protector. And so you see the manipulation of Jews for the benefit of colonial powers. Let's talk about the Balfour Declaration because few other documents have had such a profound impact for well more than a century now because the, the impact goes on and on. Let's just talk about that as well. Yeah, I think it's important to think of the Balfour Declaration as sort of a direct precursor to the Nakba, which we're talking about today, right? So you're right to point out that, you know, merely a year later with the Balfour Declaration, the British basically make this commitment to set up a Jewish nation state in in Palestine. And hopefully in our conversation, we can talk a little bit about what it means to have uh, 
demographically defined nation state. Um, but, you know, this, this idea that there would be a British mandate over the region until a Jewish state could be established um, revealed a deep hypocrisy on the part of the British because the British had promised Arabs uh, that it would fight for their national liberation, that it would fight for their independence from the Ottomans. It, it made that promise back in 1915, so two years before Balfour. And then, of course, just kind of turns on a dime, and Balfour undoes all of this, which, again, should come as no surprise to anyone who's studied colonialism. Um, you know, I think people, a lot of analysts have made some apt um, theorizations about the roots of Balfour. So as you point to, it, it sort of promised this uh, bulwark of Western colonialism in this strategically important region. I mean, that is evidenced by, as we mentioned earlier, the sort of top-down nature of these declarations. The Balfour Declaration refers to the indigenous population, Palestinians, as the quote-unquote non-Jewish communities in Palestine, um, just othering them right from the get-go. Um, but also it's been suggested that you know, Balfour itself was motivated by anti-Semitism, the urge to sort of remove Jewish people from Europe. This problem population needed to be removed from Europe. Um, and that's a really interesting thing that I think if we look at the, you know, Jewish European sentiment about Balfour um, and the initially the sort of deep aversion to it, as many folks recognized it as anti-Semitic at the time. Um, so, yeah, so Balfour is sort of a key precursor to what we will call the Nakba, the, the, um, the calamity, the catastrophe that is the creation of the state of Israel. Yeah, and when, when, um, when I was a kid going to school, like in elementary school, when I was learning history, and I was interested in history, so I actually paid attention, unlike most of my fellow students who, who didn't pay attention on that, um, you'd see a map of the United States and it would be like the British territory. And that would be like the 13 or the 12 colonies. Then there was the Spanish territory and that would be Florida. Then there's the French territory and that would go, you know, all the whole area from south to north, from New Orleans all the way up to the upper northwest. That was French territory. So there was no, there was never anything called Indian territory or indigenous territory. These were the colonizers had decided who was going to be living where and who was going to have jurisdiction. And it's the same thing with the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes-Picot. Like, as you pointed out, the people who actually had lived there for thousands and thousands of years are never consulted. And it's not considered like an anomaly in our education system where we talk about who controls what territory. It's just considered to be like normal. And so people are, are educated with normalizing colonialism. And then once they become sort of aware that this might be bad, they're spoon fed all this racism as if the troubles domestically in these different places are homegrown and the consequence of the inferior status or capabilities of the people who live in the areas. I mean, it's the same thing. And as you said, same thing in India or the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, I mean, that's how, um, you know, that's that's how colonialism works through these sort of obviously racist justifications for itself. I mean, the assumptions that Palestinian folks are somehow um, more inclined to terrorism, that they are incapable of democratic governance, that they disrespect life. I mean, one of the most racist um, tropes you'll see out there is that, you know, Palestinians, that Hamas will use small children as human shields, sort of absolving the Israeli occupation forces from their systematic assault on children. Um, these are the racist tropes we see of, of colonizers everywhere. Yeah, let's, um, well, before I go into some of the more recent history, I want to also make this point and get you to comment on it, if you would. Jews in Europe did not want to go to Palestine. I mean, and if you think about it, if people are living in like advanced industrial societies, like Europe was the center of capitalism, modern cities, urban life, you know, uh, you know, people generally don't want to move to a place with a lower level of the means of production, for instance. You, you see refugee flows from the global 
south to the north, not the other way around. European Jews didn't want to go to Palestine before World War II. Most Jews in Europe were ex absolutely opposed to Zionism. Exactly. And that lends some credence to this um, theory of the anti-Semitic motivations of the Balfour Declaration itself. I mean, look, you know, I think this assumption that and, and it's, a, it's a terrible assumption that somehow, you know, the, the Muslim world is uniquely anti-Semitic. I mean, there is this conflation of the Palestinian freedom struggle and uh, Islam uh, in ways we might talk about. But this idea that the Muslim world is somehow uniquely anti-Semitic is itself a form of racism and uh, an, a deep erasure of the very roots of anti-Semitism, which are, of course, at the heart of Western Europe. All right, let's go to now to this, the creation of the State of Israel, uh, the Nakba, the catastrophe, 750,000 people driven from their homes, ethnic cleansing, massacres by the Zionist forces, working at that point in, in, in concert really with British colonial forces at, at the moment that British colonialism says, we're going to leave. Uh, congratulations, we have a new sort of a bifurcated place where the Jews will have the state of Israel and then the Palestinians, the historic majority, will have other parts. And the United Nations, as you pointed out, was the co, you know, the United Nations authored the resolution creating the state of Israel. And oddly, the United States and its main adversary, the Soviet Union, then under the leadership of the Stalin government, both were the first to recognize the, the existence of the State of Israel. I think the Soviets' calculations were that European Jewry would be lean in a more social democratic direction, and as a consequence, a new Jewish state in the Middle East would be sort of, uh, sort of antithetical to the Cold War that was sweeping the world, that they would favor good relations between the Soviet Union and, and the West. And of course, the Soviet Red Army had been the liberators of people in the death camps. They, it was the Soviet Red Army, which lost 27 million, Soviet Union lost 27 million people who, who liberated Europe from fascism. So I think Stalin and the Soviet government thought, well, Israel will be either sympathetic or neutral to us. Okay, aside from that calculation or miscalculation, it's the UN that really is behind the state of Israel. But at first, the United States isn't 100% in the camp of the Israeli government. I mean, in 1956, when the Israelis and the British and the French collaborate to invade Egypt and to seize the Suez, the United States government was opposed to it. So Israel had these expansionist designs from the beginning and I'm, I'm going to talk about with you how the U.S. orientation towards Israel evolved and why it evolved, especially in the mid-60s. But the Israeli government from the beginning had an expansionist design. They were never satisfied with the 1948 borders. Al-Nakba wasn't a big enough catastrophe that would have satisfied the Zionist uh, settler government. And this is why, you know, all serious analysts um, and defenders of Palestinian humanity recognize that a two-state solution simply means chipping away further at Palestinian land that has already been, you know, so depleted and um, separated over the, the several decades you, you, you talk about. Um, so, you know, you're speaking about the rise of the U.S. to its, you know, superpower status, which now seems to have been quite fleeting, um, and its need to itself create its own colonial or imperialist designs um, in the Middle East. And so, you know, we really cannot understand modern day Israel, which I'm sure we'll talk about, without understanding the role of the United States. I mean, on every level. Uh, I think it's something like close to $4 billion annually that the U.S. provides to Israel. And of course, this is at a time when uh, the U.S. economy itself is in shambles, American workers struggle, you know, to afford housing, to afford school, to afford health care. Um, there is generous, generous funds available for the state of Israel. I think it's a bit erroneous to think of Israel as sort of a client 
state of, of the U.S., and, and instead to understand the sort of inherent overlaps. They're kind of mutually constitutive. Uh, you know, there is no Israel without the, the U.S., and in, in many ways there is no U.S. without Israel. So I, I spoke earlier of these deadly exchange programs in which American police departments become increasingly militarized by learning repression tactics from the Israeli military. You know, I work on a college campus. Campuses across the U.S. see... Um, increasing, you know, propaganda efforts in, in the hearts and minds of young learners. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of overlaps between the U.S. itself and the state of Israel. Yeah, it's very interesting. So let's, and I want to come back to that too. Uh, these are really important and big topics, and it's really important for people who are serious to try to, you know, get hold of this history. There's lots of books to read. Uh, in addition to our show, there's other videos that people can watch, but people have to acquaint themselves with and become knowledgeable in order to come up against the bourgeois, pro-imperialist, pro-colonial ideology. So here in 1956, Eisenhower, the Eisenhower government opposed Britain and France using Israel to seize a part of Egypt. And so they were against it and the Israelis stopped. I mean, the Soviet Union was even more ferociously against it. Khrushchev said, if it doesn't stop, perhaps a nuclear missile will land in London or something like that. In other words, it was very, he was very bellicose. And, the, and the, the invasion stopped of Egypt. But 1967, uh, Professor, there's a, a wave of pan-Arab revolution sweeping the Middle East. And this is really an important moment because... The Arab people, the Arab nation, has the capacity to form a very, very large state. There's one language, a historical culture. Uh, there's, of course, regional differences, but there's more, there's more that keeps people together than that separates them. Common religion, for the most part. And the dream of a pan-Arab state is always ever-present because it's the colonizers who divided the Arab state into these separate countries, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria. I mean, this is a project of colonialism for their domination. And the U.S. was very bogged down in 1967. It was losing the war in Vietnam. It was losing the war in Southeast Asia against the communist forces. And the Israelis carry out this, the June 1967 war against all of its Arab nature, uh, neighbors, uh, seizes the Golan Heights from Syria, seizes the West Bank, seizes Gaza, seizes a big part of Egypt. And the U.S. is thinking like, wow, this is an effective military force. Maybe they weren't a client till then, and maybe they're still, as you're pointing out, not a client, but they have a, a, a congruence of interest because if the U.S. can't police against this left-wing pan-Arab revolution that's sweeping, the Israelis can be the attack dog. Uh, anyway, that's how I view it. I, I wanted to get your thoughts, how you view that period, because it seems from then on, the U.S. and Israel have been more or less joined at the hip. I'm inclined to agree with you. You know, I mean, the shape of pan-Arabism itself was diverse in terms of like the kind of economic project it was committed to. So not all of, um, you know, pan-Arab nationalists were necessarily super left or socialist but were in many instances sort of nationalists, resource nationalists who believed that, you know, the Arab world should reap the benefits, the, the, the profits of their own resources, particularly the one right below their soil. And this was uh, diametrically opposed to the interests of the U.S. at this time. So, you know, as we talk about the decades of the, the Cold War, I mean, uh, the U.S. is opposed not only to communist or left-leaning forces, but to resource nationalists ar around the world. And, you know, the Middle East is is no exception. So I, I'm inclined to agree with you that, you know, Israel offers a really strategic partnership to the U.S. in this way to kind of stem the tide of Arab nationalism, whether it's resource nationalism or outright, you know, left-leaning socialist movements. I know you have been working and are working now on, on new a new book uh, about how U.S. imperialism in particular and imperialism writ large uh, manipulated Islam or tried to create a, a, a political extension of its own authority and power through 
uh, different political parties associated with Islam. I'm, I'm sure you there's more to it and you can expand on that. But one of the interesting pieces to this discussion, and because it's Palestine and it's a, a holy land for Muslims and Christians and Jews, a lot of times the emphasis is on religion or peoples representing different religions rather than to understand the underlying economic and political forces at play. So like a materialist, a historical materialist, a Marxist approach requires us not to look at the surface, at the superficial, but to sort of find what the root of the problem is. And you know, the I mean, US often talks about Israel as a parliamentary democracy. And then at the same time as it was supporting Israel, it was supporting the Shah in Iran who was a secular monarch. And then at other times, the US has supported the Saudi a royal family, which is a sort of reactionary Islamicist force. So it, in a way, it doesn't matter what the form, political form or ideological or theological form is of Saudi Arabia or Israel or the Shah, even though they're quite different, the essence, the root of it has to do with the economic and political interests of imperialism. Uh, this is an important part of your study, your, your works, and I, I'd like you to just expand for the audience a little bit more about this. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. will ally with any force that either protects or does not threaten sort of ruling class interests here at the heart of empire. That can mean a sort of bourgeois democracy. I certainly don't consider Israel a democracy, but it has, you know, the trappings of parliament and electoral politics increasingly less so under this far right, increasingly fascist government, which perhaps we can talk about. Um, but it has included, you know, bourgeois democracies. The U.S. has allied with monarchies. The U.S. has allied with secular governments, with religious far right governments like the Saudi government. Um, it, so it, the form of the government matters less than its sort of economic commitments. And, you, and you're right to point to that. You also mentioned this question of religiosity. You know, I mean, my work looks at Islamophobia, which I, I think is a topic that is so grossly misunderstood. It's it's almost rendered this kind of mystical, uniform kind of anti-Muslim force that exists in this way around the world, as if Muslims are somehow inherently victimized. And, you know, you can find evidence of this, whether you're looking at the far-right government of Narendra Modi in India, or you're looking at the, the rise of Donald Trump in the U.S. Of course, there's evidence of anti-Muslim racism. But what I want to add to this conversation about anti-Muslim racism is the ways in which the U.S. has found a key strategic ally in right-wing forms of Muslim religiosity at key moments in time. Now, you know, returning to Israel and Palestine, you're right, people make a huge mistake when they conflate the settler colonial violence, the imperialist project of Israel with some kind of quintessentially religious Jewish Muslim conflict that misses the point, as we discussed earlier. But of course, Israel itself is committed to um, propagating that image. I mean, let's remember that it was during Ramadan, very recently, you know, the holy month of Muslims, that there was this assault in Al-Aqsa Mosque. I mean, this happens seemingly every Ramadan when Israel, during the holiest nights of the year for observant Muslims, will carry out these assaults in mosques, which, of course, adds to the perception that this is a religious conflict, that this is Jewish versus Muslim, which couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and I, I recall a headline, it must have been in the New York Times, which has a really committed habit of doing this when it covers Israel. It said, you know, that, is, that, that, that Israeli forces um, opened fire on Muslims who had barricaded themselves in the Holy Mosque, barricaded themselves and implied that there was some kind of military project going on, not the fact that a lot of observant Muslims take the last 10 days of Ramadan to sit in meditation in a mosque. Where was their cultural competency consultant then? Um, so, you know, uh, the urge to render this some kind of uh, religious conflict is, is a complex one and it has many, many roots. Um, but yes, yeah, so I am really interested in thinking about how uh, right-wing Islamist forces have been key in shaping U.S. powers and, and how more specifically, the Central Intelligence Agency has been a key agent of those projects.
Let's go on to, as we're sort of marching through this history, we started in 1917 with Sykes-Picot and the Balfour Declaration and then the, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and then the 1956 Suez Crisis where Israel, Britain, and France team up together to invade Egypt. And again, the British are trying to hold on to the now declining British Empire, which was so dominant uh, all around the world, the sun never set on the British Empire, but in particular, Egypt and, and the Middle East were vital to British imperial positions. Then 1967 and the Israeli war, where the Israelis seized the West Bank and they seized Gaza and the Golan Heights from Syria and a big part, again, uh, of Egypt and there's all these resolutions that have been passed by the United Nations. Resolution, well, you, you will know the names of them, but 242 and others that say, look, it's, it's the US, the, Israel must return the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights. It, it finally left Egypt as a consequence of the Camp David summit accords between Jimmy Carter and, and uh, the Egyptian president and, and Menachem Begin uh, the Israeli government, that was in 1979. So Israel leaves Egypt, and in return, Egypt signs its own separate peace uh, with the Israelis, meaning that the largest Arab army is out of the picture, no longer in a confrontational mode with the Israelis. And, and in the West, that's heralded as a great moment for peace. And the Israelis are thinking, and the U.S. Pentagon and the CIA are thinking, well, okay, Egypt's been shelved. We made a separate peace deal with Egypt. The Israelis then immediately invade Lebanon. That's in 1982, where the PLO was headquartered. And they march and bomb all the way up to Beirut and then occupy Lebanon for the next 20 years until resistance forces drove the Israelis out. But it shows that peace with the Israeli government under its current configuration isn't really peace. Peace means you sideline this army or that army in a separate peace so that Israeli expansionist designs can, can rev up. And there's this inherent expansionism of the Israeli project. And as you see, every step along the way, it becomes more fascistic, more racist. And even today, now young Jewish Americans who in the past could have been counted on as loyal allies of the, of the Israeli project and people were being taken to Israel all the time and spoon-fed all the propaganda that Israel is a, a safe haven from reactionary anti-Semitism and it's a, you know, our sort of final protector. Now, um, as a consequence of this march of endless expansionism, embrace of fascism, embrace of racism, a lot of Jewish Americans and Jews everywhere are thinking like, no, I don't want to be part of this. Anyway, let's talk about both of those, the, the, the inherent drive of the Israelis and then its political impact. Yeah, I mean, the, the Nakba itself was not a finite contained event. Uh, Palestinians recognize it as an ongoing event. And that, I would say, becomes essentially clear when we look at the events of the last year. So I'm sure many of your viewers are familiar with the hunger striker uh, Khader Adnan, who recently passed away after a really remarkable hunger strike to draw attention to his detention for nearly a decade without trial, without charge, which is you know, just an ordinary MO of the Israeli occupation forces. Um, and but what many of them might not know is that his body has not been released to his family. And in fact, the state of Israel has a deliberate practice of holding the bodies of people killed by Israel in morgues. They become sort of this secondary site of incarceration for people. And the reason is because a funeral for someone like Qadir Adnan would likely be a huge demonstration. I mean, not just a mourning of his death, a celebration of his life, but a demonstration against Israeli repression. Uh, we saw this last year with the murder of Shireen Abu Akleh, where her funeral became a secondary site of Israeli repression, where forces were unleashed on the, you know, the mourners, the people who were carrying her coffin, and were attacked um, and, you know, against all odds, managed to keep her coffin raised. 
Um, so, you know, this kind of violence is part and parcel of Israeli apartheid. Um, last year, 2022 was the deadliest year in the West Bank since the end of the second intifada, since in almost 20 years. Um, there's been a remarkable increase in settler raids, uh, attacks. Um, of course, Gaza has sustained bombings most recently, just a couple days ago. And of course, these bombings don't just take lives, but they destroy infrastructure. They destroy uh, fishing communities. They destroy water treatment plants. They destroy hospitals and school buildings. And of course, Gaza can't rebuild from these because they really languish under this gutting blockade. Uh, even the diet of Gazans is is legislated by Israel. Um, so this this repressive climate is why we see such a wave of resistance uh, led by Palestinian people, but really around the world. I mean, campuses across this country have SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine chapters. Um, you find in every city and many towns across this country, uh, BDS movements, that's the Boycott, Divest, and uh, sanctions movement. Um, the nation hired Muhammad al Kurd, a Palestinian journalist, to write for them. Uh, you know, whatever your critiques of her may be, it was Rashida Talib in Congress who held a Nakba event, um, much to the consternation of both establishment Democrats and Republicans. There's the Amnesty Apartheid Report. Um, so, you know, this kind of repression is not going uh, unmet with a fierce resistance around the world. There's an underlying revolutionary element to supporting the Palestinians. And, you know, I want to I want to mention this. And I think it's important for again, for our audience to kind of wrap their heads around it, think about it a little bit. And I also want to get your reaction. When the war in Vietnam was going on, there was a lot of liberal opposition to the war and the ruling class had different positions because some parts of the ru American capitalist ruling class thought the war was a mistake, it couldn't be won, better to cut our losses. When it came to, say, the liberation of South Africa, a section of the ruling class, including Democratic Party politicians, they were out there in front of the South African embassy in Washington getting arrested. Uh, in El Salvador, there were sanctuary cities created to support the Salvadoran liberation movement. The same with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and including a bunch of Democratic politicians. But when it comes to the state of Israel, when it comes to the state of Israel, there's no, there's no liberal Democratic Party opposition at all. You mentioned Omar is one, and maybe there's a couple others. It's only a handful. There's 435 members of the House of Representatives. It couldn't be more than three or four or five who actually even take a liberal position uh, in opposition to Israel. And as a consequence, uh, professor, one of the things that happened in the U.S. liberal anti-war movement was because there was no ruling class support for the pal Palestinians, the left also shamefully also turned its back on the Palestinians. It didn't have that kind of liberal wing of the Democratic Party that it was looking to. So it was only like the organization that I help organize, the Answer Coalition, we broke the taboo on Palestine. We organized the demonstration after the Israeli reinvasion of the West Bank, uh, which happened in the spring of 2002. We had a demonstration of 100,000 people for Palestine. And most of the left forces uh, uh, boycotted our action. They wouldn't support it. They thought, oh, no, you can't support the Palestinians. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries, the new leader for the Democrats in the House, I mean, he's giving militant, it sounds like militant speeches in form, except they're for Israel. They're not like traditional civil rights speeches. There's, they're speeches for war. Uh, let's talk about why, I want to get your opinion. Why is there such like hegemony for the Zionist project or sort of, failure for any liberal opposition to really uh, you know, show itself within the halls of Congress or within the capitalist parties. Yeah, I mean, you're really right to point to the fact that there is no room in formal America, American politics to take a, a stand on Israel. And, you know, when a sort of milk toast stand is taken by someone who might in some instances be seen as having some pro-Palestinian views, it always begins with, you know, 
an affirmation of Israel's right to defend itself, which is always a thinly veiled justification for whatever kind of assault uh, the Israeli state has carried out upon the Palestinian people. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there's this bipartisan consensus that you're talking to. And I, I think, you know, this becomes a really edifying moment for a lot of young people coming to politics when they learn just how uniform this consensus is in American former politics um, around the question of, of Palestine. Um, you know, so you can have someone like Vice President Kamala Harris, who's getting all kinds of props from sort of feminist segments of the American population, seeing her as some kind of quote unquote intersectional hero, but then she'll be grinning and shaking the hand of a far right leader like Netanyahu, a person who has now lined his cabinet with people with hate group affiliations, with terrorism charges. Um, so, you know, the, um, the American political system is inherently led by the interests of, of its bourgeois state imperialist commitments, which include this commitment to supporting Israel. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it, it would be, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it would almost be impossible for somebody to attain a high level of political office in this country, especially given, you know, the ways in which um, pro-Israeli lobby groups exercise inordinate influence over our elected officials. Um, and, you know, you'll often see people campaigning, you pointed to, you know, Hakeem Jeffries, but a lot of people who kind of get a lot of progressive cred. But then when you scroll down to this question, it's uniformly uh, pro-Israel. It's almost like the litmus test for joining the formal American political establishment. Yeah, indeed it is. It really is. And I think that's why the issue of Palestine and solidarity with Palestine, which is going to grow and grow and grow, as you said, BDS, the Boycott, Divest, Sanctions movement is going to increase. It puts this, this movement at a direct loggerheads with both capitalist parties because both capitalist parties, in spite of all of their fighting with each other, and they want to impeach each other, and they want to say both both sides say sort of argue that the other party is treasonous. But when it comes to the military budget, and when it comes to support for the state of Israel, there's unanimity, almost pure unanimity. And as a consequence, if we want to build a movement for Palestine, it actually has to be a movement against U.S. imperialism. You. Can, even if you want to make it an isolated issue, even if you want to pretend to play like old style liberal politics, like was played in the Vietnam War, where you're hoping, hoping, hoping some element of the capitalist establishment will embrace your cause for peace, that's a complete fantasy when it comes to Palestine. That's not about to happen. And that's why uh, I think for those of us who are talking about this, not because it's interesting, but because we want to create movements for change, uh, it's important to help people draw out the actual truly anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist character of the issue, which you would think on its face, you, would, you could support Palestine without being an enemy of capitalism. But if you live in the United States and you want to really support Palestine, you have to be an enemy of US, the U.S. capitalist state because it will not budge on this question. You know, I did uh, for my first book and for my dissertation research with Muslim American uh, organizations. These are sort of multicultural groups that uh, do cultural and religious programming for Muslims, but they also do a lot of work sort of representing Muslims to the American public, the non-Muslim public, you might say. And this question of Palestine was really interesting. I mean, a lot of the Arab members of these organizations remained fiercely committed to the liberation of Palestine. So in spite of what the Egyptian government may have done or what other Arab states may have done, the people of these countries are often quite fiercely committed to the cause of Palestinian liberation. But you would see a sort of divide sometimes with um, non-Arab Muslims, perhaps South Asians who didn't necessarily or, or, or thought it wasn't politically expedient to take a stand on Palestine. So in other words, they would say, well, yes, of course I reject, um, you know, Israeli settler violence, but like, we first, we Muslims need to become legitimate in this country, and then we can talk about this issue. Um, you know, there, there are literal Zionist organizations that sponsor Muslims from America, and they typically are South Asian, non-Arab Muslims, to go take these sort of 
tours of Israel and then come mm. back and write glowing op-eds in mainstream American publications about how, you know, we don't need BDS, we just need dialogue. Uh, both sides have done bad things and we just need interfaith conversations and basically a complete deflection from the issues that we've been discussing, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think that this became really remarkable to me in one of my conversations while I was doing my field work with a Muslim American woman who was, you know, originally from Pakistan. And she was taking this, uh, this stand about, you know, yes, I, I support the liberation of Palestine, but it's just never going to happen in the U.S. All of American politics is pro-Israel. It would be social and political suicide for Muslims to make this their issue. And of course, you know, she worked as an engineer for Boeing. Um, and this is really important. We mentioned earlier the nearly $4 billion of annual aid, a package, I believe, that was assembled under the Obama administration for Israel. Um, that's basically a subsidy to American weapons manufacturers, you know, a key foundational cornerstone in the American capitalist economy. So that's really, I think, the point you're making about if you want to see um, an end to Israeli settler colonial violence, you have to want to see an end to this system we call capitalism, an economic system that is gutting the lives of Americans too. All right, we're going to leave it right there. We've been talking to Dr. Nazia Kazi. She's a professor of anthropology at Stockton University, the author of the book, Islamophobia, Race, and Global Politics. Please go buy that book. It has uh, an updated version, just re-released not too long ago. And of course, we look forward to your, your upcoming book on the topic that you discussed with us. Uh, Dr. Kazi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. 